Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Steve Skolnick and I currently serve as your uh, president of your board of directors. So I need to start with two announcements this afternoon. One is if you have a question about the Homes Improvement Program, the Pilot Program, the Replacement Reserves Program, or any other matter regarding your GHI home or our GHI homes, maybe, maybe I should say, I invite you to write your question on a card. The cards are available at the table near the entry of the hall and also in baskets. We have some volunteers. And hand it to one of our volunteers. Will volunteers with baskets raise your hand and big smile? Okay, great. And my uh, second announcement is that we are recording video graphing this um, this meeting and it is going to be for public broadcast both on cable tv and on ghi's youtube channel hopefully so if you wish to ask a question later on when it's q a but you don't want your face to be on the video that is your right don't come up to the microphone but instead use the written cards and hand your question in and write it okay so throughout the meeting, we'll be collecting these cards and sorting and collating so we can do our best to respond quickly and effectively to your questions. Oh, one question per card, please, otherwise we won't be able to sort them properly. So let me start by introducing some of the folks who are at the podium with me. We have our board of directors members. We have Sue Rady, our vice president, and Chuck S., our treasurer, and Ed James, our secretary, and Pat Novinsky. Pat is and we have Aaron Markovich, and we have Bill Jones, and we have Diana McFadden, and we have Frank DiBernardo. And we also have staff members who are with us. We have our general manager, Eldon Ralph, over here, Joe Perry, our director of finance, George Bachman, our director of maintenance, Joan, oh, where's Joan? She was here, she's somewhere else. Oh, there's Joan, okay, great. Uh, we have Tom Sporty, our director of technical services, uh, Sherry Swain, our special assistant to the manager and communications coordinator par excellence. And our brand new Maisha McNeil. Yes, she is. Okay, our brand new human resources manager. Welcome to Maisha. I would like to thank also our communications committee folks for providing the visual display for this meeting. Uh, committee Chair Lauren Cummings, thank you. And the volunteers who are collecting your question cards. Again, if you're if you have a basket and you're collecting question cards, raise your hand. Raise your basket, whatever. Okay, if you, and if you in the audience want to ask a question, write it on the card, just wave it and one of those folks will find you, hopefully. Did you miss Jim? Yes. I miss, oh my God. I miss Jim Cohen. <laughs> I didn't even know Jim. <laughs> the, uh, Jim is the chair of our buildings committee and an incredibly wonderful contributor to the well-being of the GHI community. That's right, you can pay me later. Uh, our meeting today is being recorded again thanks to Greenbelt Access Television or Gate. The recording will be shown on Gate's cable channel, which is Fios 19 and Comcast 77. And we also hope to have it on the YouTube channel. I also want to thank Greenbelt City Council for continued interest in and support of GHI. If you're a council member and you're here, raise your hand so I can recognize you. See, no council members. Okay, yeah, great. Where's County Council? Oh, there's Todd. Hello. Afternoon, everyone. <laughs> and of course, thanks to the Greenbelt Volunteer Fire Department and Emergency Medical Services for making this all available to us today. And for the safety of you. I do need to mention a few housekeeping items. First, uh, our meeting needs to end promptly at 4. Good luck with that, right? No, we, we do need to, because we're, we're supposed to uh, we're supposed to be out of the hall by 4:15. So work with me. During the question and comment period, those who wish to speak should approach the mic. We have a mic in the center aisle here. Uh, mic's over there. We may move it and uh, and line up and limit your remarks to two minutes or less so that everybody has a chance. And if you've already had a chance to speak, please do not get up to speak again until all who have who do wish to speak have had one opportunity. And while we may have differences of opinion, let us express our thoughts respectfully and avoid any personal comments about the members. Okay, so our agenda today includes a brief report on the state of the co-op, which you will have to put up with me for, 
Then we get Jim Cohen, our Buildings Committee Chair, who will summarize the pilot program, emphasis on phase three, the testing of heating systems. Then Vice President Rady, who will summarize the recommendation that your board has selected for the upcoming home improvement program. Then we'll have an update on what's happening with our crawl spaces, our favorite topic. And then our general manager, Mr. Ralph, will present a timeline for this year's work preparing for the HIP. And then the rest of our meeting will be dedicated to your questions and comments. So, here we go. The state of the co-op, I am pleased to say, Greenville Homes Incorporated is strong and healthy. Through proactive conservative fiscal management, your directors and your general manager successfully maintain our unique and historic organization of affordable housing and close-knit community. We have weathered the Great Recession. More GHI homes were sold in 2014 than any year since 2007, and the number of members with underwater share loans, what that means is your share loan amount that you owe is greater than the value of your home, it's not a good place to be, is steadily decreasing. Home prices are recovering, although slowly, and I don't know if any of you read the Washington Post, but there's a front page article in today's post about housing in Prince George's County, and we're lagging behind for sure. But GHI, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. Okay, so to accomplish our goal of maintaining our homes into perpetuity, GHI has mounted a pilot program, now nearing completion, I'm happy to say, to test a number of building improvements that could help our aging structures to be more comfortable and more energy efficient. Heads up work and good fortune brought us an organization of building scientists and engineers and a federal grant to pay them. The learning we've had and the information we've gained is of tremendous value and will serve GHI for many years. So during the pilot program, one area has been identified that needs serious improvement and those are crawl spaces beneath many of our homes, which maybe could have used more attention over the years and are in poor condition, some of them. We are taking steps to correct this, and I will tell you about that in a few minutes. So let me say something about being a member of the cooperative. A member of the cooperative is different than a traditional homeowner. There are many misconceptions about this, even among GHI members, so I would like to review a few of the basics with you. The U.S. government designed and built Greenbelt, one of three new towns in the 1930s. It was a Depression-era project of the Works Project Administration, the FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration, and was originally a low-income rental community. The frame homes were constructed in the early 1940s as wartime housing in Washington was needed for defense workers, and the cooperative itself was formed by residents in 1952. Founders purchased the homes and a portion of the lands from the federal government. Each co-op member owns a share of the entire property, you and me, but does not own his or her specific home outright. All members together jointly own our entire property and all the homes and buildings. Each co-op member enters an agreement, the Mutual Ownership Contract, or MOC, with the cooperative. This gives the member the right to occupy his or her home and establishes the rights and responsibilities of membership in the co-op. We are a 100% member equity cooperative, and what that means is that each member gets to sell his or her, her share at market value and keep all the proceeds, co-op getting none except for an administrative fee. Members pay a monthly fee, as you well know, <laughs> that includes a number of costs. Real estate taxes are a huge piece of it, maintenance of buildings and grounds, administration, trash collection, garage rentals, replacement reserve funds, and so forth. The Replacement Reserves Plan is a pool of money we collect and use to replace components of our community buildings that have outlived their functional lifespan, not only buildings, by the way, parking areas and sidewalks are in that RRP. The level of collecting and of spending are forecast by GHI in consulting with a professional firm that updates the plan every year. The RRP does not allocate funds to a specific component, like a door or a window, Rather, it works like an insurance policy, so pool funds are available for doors and windows when those are needed. By the way, there was no RRP before the 1980s rehab project. How many people were here for the 1980s rehab project? Oh, quite a number, all right. At that time, members voted and proved borrowing nearly $20 million, and that is 
$24 million, there you go. <laughs> Uh, to do the work that was needed. And aren't we glad now that over many years, members have paid those loans off in full. In our upcoming Homes Improvement Program, some items are to be funded from the RRP and some are not. Specifically, the replacement of entry doors and windows and frame home vinyl siding are covered by the Reserves Replacement Fund. The board is currently discussing a proposal to move forward now with recommendations on our heating system alternatives, rather than waiting for the full completion of the pilot program next summer. This is news. Doing this will, would allow members to more accurately know what increase in monthly charges to anticipate, thereby informing your ability to decide which member options, if any, to select in the Homes Improvement Program. We haven't decided about that yet, but we're talking about it. Now, I would like to introduce the chair of our buildings committee, Jim Cohen. Jim will tell us how things are coming in the pilot program. Thank you, Steve. As you know, the pilot program has involved the testing of alternative building envelope improvements and heating systems on 28 GHI units. And that includes three rows of block units, two rows of frame units, and two rows of brick units. GHI has had the benefit of technical assistance from the Home Innovation Research Labs, or uh, HIRL, PERL, uh, the research unit of the National Association of Home Builders. In the first year, PERL uh, recorded year-long readings of, uh, in these pilot units, the uh, unit temperature, humidity, and energy use to provide a baseline data for the next two phases. In phase two, completed in early 2014, uh, this consisted of selected improvements to some of the components of the pilot unit's building envelopes. That's the, uh, the components of our homes, like doors, windows, and siding that separate our uh, homes from the uh, outside weather. Currently, in the third phase, GHI is testing a small number of heating system alternatives. With Hurdle's assistance, the Buildings Committee initially looked at a number of heating systems that might be used in GHI units. Among the systems analyzed were four different types of heat pumps, uh, ad ducted heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, um, or geothermal systems, high velocity heat pumps, and um, ductless mini split heat pumps. Additional systems considered for phase three were wall mounted resistance heaters with fans, radiant heat panels, and electric baseboard heaters with programmable uh, setback wall thermostats on the first floor and digital thermostats for upstairs bedrooms. Yes, our current type of electric baseboard heaters have always been an option due to their low life cycle costs. Several systems were not considered, such as natural gas and pro um, propane, oil, and wood fire heating due to the cost of the fuel or the need for infrastructure to store and or deliver fuel to appliances. From Hurdle's analysis, five systems were recommended for testing in the pilot program. Pilot program members were given an orientation on alternatives in November of 2013, and were able to visit GHI units that already had these systems to uh, see what they look like, find out how much they cost, see how much exterior and interior space they required, and to hear from members about their experiences with the systems, including uh, what their energy bills were. Following the information meetings and the tours, pilot program members were allowed to choose which heating systems they wanted to test in their homes. So last year, the uh, pilot member selections resulted in the following options being tested in phase three. Seven pilot program members chose to have no new installation and to rely on their existing baseboard heaters. Ten of the pilot members are currently testing new electric baseboard heaters with wall-mounted programmable setback thermostats downstairs and digital thermostats for the upstairs bedrooms. One member is testing a ducted heat pump system. This system had been installed previously by a former member living in the unit. Ten pilot members are testing ductless uh, mini-split heat pump systems in their units. One of the benefits of the heat pump systems is that they provide air conditioning as well as heating. 
And over the past two years, many GHI members have installed ductless mini split systems in their units. And anecdotal information from members who have these systems uh, indicates that there's a high level of satisfaction with them. These systems are being tested in six block units and four frame units. Since one of the pilot program's goals is to do the energy efficiency upgrades in a manner that will preserve the unique and historic nature of GHI units, we're very interested in seeing how the systems being tested in pilot uh, units, uh, in pilot phases two and three, perform in the block units. That's because exterior insulation and siding applied to block units, while making them uh, more comfortable, will alter their historic character. Um, it's for this reason that over a year and a half ago, some building committee members, GHI staff, and uh, a couple of people from Hurl uh, went up to uh, Towson to meet with the Maryland Historic Trust to inquire about the possibility of obtaining grant money to test options for insulating the block units either on the interior or using an exterior insulation strategy that closely resembles cinder block. The trust provided a grant to an architectural firm that specializes in historic structures to study the alternatives. That study was completed over a year ago, and the study recommended that only one of the alternatives be uh, given consideration. That was uh, external insulation and finishing system, or EIFS, or E-I-F-S. But this system was prohibitively expensive and the Buildings Committee found additional problems with this, uh, the system's durability. Uh, Eleven of the above-mentioned pilot units are also testing radiant ceiling heaters in their bathrooms, and eight of those 11 units are also testing radiant ceiling heaters in their kitchens. All of the heating systems being tested in the pilot program are in place and are currently being evaluated. So in closing, I invite you to check out the pilot program website to access, access the hurl reports from all these phases. I also invite you to become a friend of the committee. As a friend, you'll be emailed our agenda materials in advance of each meeting, and we have a meeting this coming uh, Wednesday, which I'll, I'll say something else about. We, we currently have over 180 friends of this committee, and many of them are active participants in our meetings. And in closing, I want to thank some especially good friends, and those are our pilot program participants who are doing an invaluable service to our cooperatives. So they really deserve it. <laughs> on the agenda, one of the items on the agenda for this Wednesday's meeting is uh, we have a fellow who's a, uh, uh, with the uh, community forklift. Uh, we're exploring uh, the possibility, which looks like a very strong possibility, of being able, when we go through the uh, replacement, the windows and doors, of recycling them through a uh, uh, community forklift. So that, that will be one of the agenda items for Wednesday. Thank you all. Next, we're going to hear from Vice President Sue Rady, who will summarize the board's recommendations for our homes improvement programs, on which we members will be voting later this spring. Sue? I apologize to those of you who have heard this information ad nauseum. <laughs> but we always have some new people just tuning in. The pilot program is drawing to a close. In 2010, we embarked with high hopes, great expectations, and a good deal of enthusiasm on a pilot program to test a set of improvements recommended by Homes Innovation Research Laboratory. The purpose of the pilot program was to provide information specific to our GHI homes. This information would be useful to the membership in making decisions regarding the changes to be made to our homes during the community-wide Homes Improvement Program. I have to offer a little disclaimer there because community-wide is a bit of a misnomer as this program does not include our nine freestanding homes and our 25 larger town homes built around 1970. These homes are on a different schedule. The goals of the home improvement upgrades tested during the pilot program were to conserve energy, uh, to improve member comfort, 
to emphasize sustainable environmentally friendly solutions, to prioritize lower lifestyle cost, to minimize member disruption, and to maintain unique, the unique and historic character of GHI. It's not going to be all I'm missing though. <laughs> uh, during the pilot program, envelope improvements were successfully accomplished in seven rows of GHI homes. The results have been measured and analyzed. We have received feedback from the pilot members. The, the findings are not as strong as we had hoped. In a nutshell, these improvements do save energy, but not as much as anticipated. Over the life of the, of the improvements, the cost of most of the improvements would not be recovered through energy savings. That is, most cases, in most cases, the payback periods are longer than the life of the improvement. Based on scientific measurement and anecdotal evidence, homes are more comfortable. The cost of making all of the recommended improvements to all of our homes would make our homes unaffordable to some current members. The work can be accomplished without major disruption to members. The only cost-effective way of insulating the walls of our block homes results in a change to their, in their historic appearance. Next year, we will begin the five-year Homes Improvement Program. The Homes Improvement Program will include both replacement of building envelope elements that are covered by replacement reserves and additional improvements that are not covered by replacement reserves. Those improvements that are covered by our replacement reserves will be accomplished on all homes unless the member has already done this work in a manner that meets co-op standards. These include uh, for frame homes, replacement of the double hung windows and, and uh, with a similar style window, replacement of entrance doors and door frames, and replacement of the siding. For masonry homes, that is brick and block homes, the replacement of the slider windows with a similar style window, and the replacement of entrance doors and door frames. These items covered by the the replacement reserves were not the only envelope improvements tested during the pilot program, as you just heard from Jim. However, if we, the co-op, undertake any improvements not covered by replacement reserves, we will need to borrow money to do so. Members will repay this loan through their co-op fees. This brings us to the board recommendation regarding envelope improvements. In addition to the improvements covered by replacement reserves, the board voted in December to recommend the following to the membership. The membership will vote on the board's recommendations in the spring. Please note that the board has not yet made a recommendation regarding envelope improvements in the crawl spaces, nor has the board yet made recommendations regarding heating systems. Okay, so for frame homes, uh, the, there are several work options here, and then I'll lead you to the board dis decision on this, a recommendation on this. In the attics, we are talking about air sealing, the attic perimeter, and the board has recommended that that be done in all homes. And the, uh, also in the attics, we're talking about insulated and installing gaskets around the attic hatches, and that will be done in all homes. Both of those prevent air from, uh, warm air from the home going up into the attic and heating uh, unnecessary space. Uh, and then the third attic option is to install blown-in insulation to increase the R value from R16 to R38, reduce, and then that would reduce the storage area. And the board's recommendation is that that would be a member option, which would mean uh, not in everyone's home, but in the homes of people who chose to do that work, have that work done in their homes. Then there, uh, during the pilot program, there were crawl space insulation and vapor barriers installed, but the board has not yet made a recommendation on what will happen to crawl space. We are continuing to study crawl spaces, and Steve will tell you more about that in a minute. And then there were moisture control measures uh, done during the pilot program of installing bathroom fans with timer switches and exhaust to the outside, and the board has recommended that that be a member option, whether or not to have these fans installed. And then there was adding wall insulation underneath the, the vinyl siding. The siding is a replacement reserve item, the insulation is not. So to install an inch of insulation under the vinyl siding, the board is recommending that that be a member option for the frame homes, for the brick homes. Again, we'll go through the same things for the attic insulation. To air seal the attic perimeter, the board is recommending that be done in all homes. To insulate and install gaskets around attic hatches, the board is recommending that be done in all homes. 
to install blow-in insulation to increase the R value from R16 to R38, reducing storage area. The board has recommended that that be a member option. And then the crawl space insulation and vapor barrier work is uh, still to be decided on the recommendation. Moisture control, install with bathroom fan with timer switches and exhaust to the outside. The board is recommending that as a member option. And windows to install <coughs> casement windows instead of the sliders. The board is recommending that that be a member option. There is an additional charge for casement windows that cost about twice as much as sliders. So uh, the members will be different, uh, responsible for the difference in that cost. And block homes, we uh, install a vinyl insta insulation, insulation over two inches of, uh, and, and let me get this right now, install a vinyl siding over two inches of insulation. The board is recommending that as a member option. Crawl spaces, again, are still to be decided. Moisture control. And again, install the bathroom fan with timer switches and exhaust to the outside. The board is recommending that as a member option. The cost blocks are particularly susceptible to moisture problems. There's an additional option there, which is to install an automatic control for fan operation throughout the day. So even when you're not at home, the fan will go on and off and uh, remove moisture from the home. And the window option is the same as for the bricks, and that is to install casement windows instead of sliders. And the board is recommending that also as a member option. Now, what do these recommendations mean? The board is recommending that the membership vote in favor of undertaking the work of sealing of attic perimeters and the insulation of attic hatches in all homes that have attics at the relatively low cost of approximately $425 per frame home and $375 per brick home. This recommendation will be taken to the membership for vote in the spring. The board recommends that all other envelope uh, improvements that are not covered by replacement reserves be undertaken only in those units in which individual members, perhaps with the member in the adjacent unit or the member in the entire, and the members in the entire row, choose to have the work done and to incur the cost of this work. So if the board recommendation is member option, the board is recommended that each individual member will choose whether or not these improvements will be done in his or her unit. Members who choose optional work will be responsible for, for paying for this work through their co-op fees over a period of years, unless a member prefers to avoid interest charges by paying up front. All homes improvement program work will be contracted on a schedule by the co-op, performed under the supervision of co-op staff, and completed during the Homes Improvement Program. For planning purposes, the members will be asked to make their choices a few months before the Homes Improvement Program is scheduled to reach their row of homes. The board will soon be making recommendations regarding heating systems and crawl space improvements. Steve will now talk about crawl spaces. I, I, I actually wanted to say, and I'm going to say anyway, Steve will now shed a little light on the crawl spaces. <laughs> Okay, now for our favorite topic, crawl spaces, which are an integral part of our Homes Improvement Program, in case anybody is unclear about that. The crawl spaces are an integral part of our homes. They are an integral part of the envelope, which is the, the, all of the components of the structure that separate us from the outdoors, and therefore they are a part of the HIP Homes Improvement Program. Early in the pilot program, the Building Science Consultants and the Buildings Committee identified a plan for the two different types of crawls that we have in GHI. And here's a summary of the work that we did in the pilot program. This is work that's already complete. For the frame homes, our floor decks in the frame homes are made of wood, and the crawls are ventilated. And the pilot program remediations included identifying and correcting groundwater incursion into the crawl space, hugely important, removing failing fiberglass bat insulation, replacing plastic sheeting vapor barriers on the earthen floors, extending up onto the foundation walls and securing them, applying spray foam insulation to the underside of the flooring, testing and repairing or replacing sump pumps as needed, sealing entrances to the steam tunnels between buildings to stop animal incursion, and examining and resecuring vent grills as needed 
to stop animal incursion. Some of you who haven't uh, lived in GHI for a long time won't remember that when the community was built, it was built with central heating plants and steam heat, and there were pipes that ran from the central plants under the ground and, in, and through the crawl spaces from building to building to building. And that's the way we got our heat and domestic hot water, by the way. And that was abandoned and uh, when we went to electric heat and electric hot water heaters back in the early 80s. But the steam tunnels are still there and it is a way that animals get into our crawl spaces and that's a problem which we're now needing to rectify. We have learned that there may be issues over the use of spray foam insulation with concerns stemming from the potential toxicity of materials also, application of the foam under the floor decks is very expensive. It encapsulates pipes and wires that might need servicing in the future, making repairs more difficult and time consuming and possibly hazardous if the foam has to be cut out of the way. So the Buildings Committee's Special Task Force on Crawl Spaces through study and hard work. Is Richard Mendes here? Where are you, Richard? Stand up. <laughs> Task Force on Crawl Spaces has identified an alternative solution whereby frame crawls can be configured as partially conditioned spaces, not ventilated. A partially conditioned crawl space is controlled for humidity and temperature as the exhaust fan draws air down through the home into the crawl and then out. This also has the effect of warming the wood floor deck. Since the air pressure in the crawl is slightly reduced by the fan, it's very important that the foundation be sealed to prevent cold air from the outside from entering it. And you will know that this crawl space configuration does not require the use of any spray foam insulation. The projected work scope for a partially conditioned crawl discussed with and vetted by our building science consultants and now approved by the board for testing in two frame rows, that would be eight homes, two rows, is as follows. When, again, identify and correct groundwater incursion into the crawl space. The crawl spaces have to be dried out. <laughs> Removing failing fiberglass bat insulation. Replacing plastic sheeting vapor barrier on the earthen floor, extending up onto the foundation walls and securing. You've heard this before, right? Mm -hmm. Installing rigid foam board insulation at the inside of the foundation walls. So that's a one inch or an inch and a half hard board foam insulation that goes on the inside <laughs> around the foundation wall. Testing and repairing the, the uh, sump pumps as needed, again. Sealing entrances to the steam tunnels between buildings to stop animal incursion. Sealing all of the vent openings into the crawl space. Installing low capacity ventilation fan with an enthalpy controller, and you can look up what enthalpy means. Providing a monitoring system for the sump pump so that if it stops working, you will know about it. And considering the need for and possibly installing a dehumidifier in some of the crawl spaces. <coughs> It would also be possible, although not required, once this is done, that members could choose to install new fiberglass or rock roll insulation bats under the floor decks. The merits and challenges of underfloor bat insulation are currently being discussed. Okay, moving on to the masonry homes, it's simpler. The floor decks are concrete in the masonry homes and the crawl spaces are sealed except for the boiler room doors. Pilot program remediation work included identifying and correcting groundwater incursion into the crawl space, repairing the perimeter foundation wall rigid foam board insulation as needed. That rigid foam board was put in during the rehab program, so it's already there, although some of it is falling down or broken and has to be repaired. Uh, replacing the plastic sheeting vapor barrier on the earthen floor, extending up onto the foundation walls and securing, <coughs> testing and repairing or replacing some pumps as needed, and testing and repairing boiler room floor drains where practical. The masonry homes each had a boiler originally, an oil-fired boiler in each row, different from the frame units, and those boiler rooms still exist, and they're much deeper by definition than the rest of the crawl space, so there is a floor drain in each of them, but some of those floor drains don't really work so well anymore. So. The only additions to this plan contemplated by the task force are to provide a method of sealing the boiler room doors possibly by constructing a weathertight door at the foot of the boiler room stairs, and to consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether, again, a dehumidifier and monitoring system might be needed. Resulting from conditions observed in some of the crawls, 
and from a report compiled by staff, the Builders Committee formed a task force and requested staff to inspect a random selection of 10% of the frame crawls. Staff's findings were not good. Having looked at 20 frame crawls, they found that most 20 buildings of the frame crawls, they found that most of the sump pumps weren't working and there was evidence of animal incursion, ponding water, and other problems. So the general manager, over there, determined to continue inspecting all 189 frame home crawls before this April. As of today, this work continues. Over 53 point something percent of the crawl spaces have been inspected and over 50% of the sump pumps have been, or just under, I think it is, 50% of the sump pumps have been repaired or replaced as needed. Sometimes the pumps were bad, sometimes the pumps were in dry wells and there really isn't a need for a pump, sometimes it was just a circuit breaker switched off. So, very efficient there. In addition, a GHI maintenance crew has begun sealing, actually two GHI maintenance crews have begun sealing the steam tunnel entrances with bricks and mortar, although slow work, this has been completed in how many buildings, Alden? 20. 20 buildings. And that work will continue until all of the <coughs> crawl space steam tunnels have been sealed. And depending on findings and on financing options for community-wide crawl space work, the board will determine whether an additional vote by the membership is needed in order to proceed with all of the crawl space remediations. So right now, we're trying out four buildings, two frames, one brick, one block, to see what we can learn. Now, I am pleased to recognize our general manager, Eldon Ralph, who will describe the timeline for the Homes Improvement Project and what 2015 holds in store. Good afternoon once again. Now that the pilot program is almost complete, the board of directors, the buildings committee, and the finance committee, as well as staff, have begun planning for a membership meeting during the spring of 2015, when members will decide what non-reserve components should be installed during the Homes Improvement Program. From January to April of this year, the Board of Directors, with inputs from the Billings Committee, the Finance Committee, and staff, will deliberate the following matters prior to a membership vote. One, the board will recommend what heating and cooling systems should be installed. Two, recommend what crawl space improvements should be installed. Three, recommend what sources of funds and loan repayment terms are needed to finance the non-reserve improvements, such as crawl space improvements, attic insulation, wall insulation, and opt-in improvements that are selected by members. Four, recommend estimated fee increases that members may have to pay for non-reserve improvements that may be selected. Five, recommend the terms for a loan deferral program to assist those members who are on fixed incomes or who might be in financial hardship situations. Six, research financial incentive programs that might be available to offset costs for the non-reserve components. And seven, recommend how loans borrowed by members should be disposed of when they sell their units. Now, we propose to begin the construction work for the Homes Improvement Program in the spring of 2016. In order for that to happen, there is a tremendous amount of planning that has to be done this year. Accordingly, once the membership decides what non-reserve components should be installed within the GHI homes, we are going to proceed by working on these activities. One, we must decide additional staff that's needed, how that staff should be organized, and the work systems that we need to put in place to execute 
the Homes Improvement Program. And the extra staff needed should be hired before the end of 2015. We must continue to keep you informed via the GHI e-newsletter and communicator, the website, through membership meetings, about the planning activities for the Homes Improvement Program as they continue to unfold. We propose to negotiate supply agreements with vendors to obtain quantity discounts for some improvements, some components such as windows, doors, siding materials. We have to decide this year on those specific units where the improvements will be undertaken during 2016 because as I said before, it's a five-year program. We've got to consider how to attract contractors to bid for the work because that was very difficult during the pilot program. And we've got to have a greater outreach to interest contractors in bidding for the homes improvement program construction work. We will develop construction schedules for the work to be done in 2016. And very importantly, after the vote is held, we then have to begin to develop bid specifications and requests for proposals for contractors to undertake the work that's going to be done in 2016. Now, let's just spend a brief time, a brief amount of time to examine the proposed scope of the Homes Improvement Program. Now, the scope of this program is going to be dependent on what the membership decides. Because the membership has got to decide what are the non-reserved components which are going to be installed within the homes. But at this moment, we envisage that between 2016 to 2020, these are the components that may be installed. Windows and doors for frame and masonry homes, definitely because that's a reserve item. It's already paid for. Baseboard heaters for frame and masonry homes, that's been already paid for. That's definitely going to be done. And similarly for siding for frame homes. Crawl space improvements for frame and masonry homes, that's a non-reserve item which the membership has got to decide upon. The sealing of attic perimeters for frame and brick homes and attic patches for brick homes, if the membership decides to do this. Split system heat pumps, wall thermostats to baseboard heaters and ceiling panel heaters. As was said earlier, the board still has to recommend whether any of these systems should be mandated for GHI homes or selected as member opt-ins. The board has recommended, already recommended, a number of items for member opt-ins. And during the membership vote, you would decide whether or not to validate what the board is recommending. And these items are exterior wall insulation for block and frame homes, attic insulation for brick and frame homes, casement windows for masonry homes, and exhaust fans for masonry and frame homes. You should also be aware that there are some other major projects that will be undertaken during 2016 to 2020 and even beyond that. And these are some examples. Between 2016 to 2025, we propose to replace all of the roofs on frame homes, on the block homes, and on the larger homes, the larger town homes. We're going to continue with the drainage remediation projects around the, around the buildings. This is something that we do every year. Since 1998, GHI has spent over three quarter million dollars installing new underground drainage systems. And this year we've got $60,000 in the budget to attend, I think it's about eight sites that we've identified. 
and the drainage inspections are continuing and we're going to address that need over the years to, to, to come. Underground utility repair projects, that's also another very large project that we are undertaking every year and we are approaching the peak and currently spending approximately $175,000 a year. And then between 2021 to 2025, there's going to be a very big project. It's going to be the replacement of plumbing pipes, which include water supply and waste piping within the frame and masonry homes, and also the electrical wiring within those homes. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. It has come to my attention that we are in the presence of uh, some city council members. Mayor Jordan is in the back, and Conrad Herling, and Robin Roberts, and Ed Coons. Thank you very much. at the beginning, um, really appreciates your continued interest in and support of GHI. Okay, where are we? Tell you what, let's take a three minute break. Everybody stand up. Now, everybody stand up. Three minutes, not 30, just three. I'm Dammy Perlman. I live at 42A, great 42, like Chuck, 42D, my neighbor. And, and 42 is for fortitude. Get it? OK. So we've been through this a lot of times. The question is, why do we have to combine everything into such a lump? In other words, I was just speaking some of the neighbors here. Why can't we do the frame homes insulation which needs to be done, the windows, the doors, which we know has to be done, which has already been paid for, why do we have to do all these pilot programs in order to connect everything and have, be perfect? Why can't we get something? Let's roll! Why can't, let's roll! Thank you for your question. Uh, and that's a, that's a question that actually has been asked many, many times. And the, the short answer is, uh, particularly on the frame homes, which are slated to get replacement of uh, exterior siding, when you, ins when you change the windows out, of course, you have to rip all of the flashing and, and everything that's around the window out as well and redo it. And if you're going to change the siding, you have to rip out the flashing for the windows when you do that. Same thing for the door frames. So if we are able to coordinate the doors, windows, and siding, and if members opt for insulation, that all be done at one time, then we're going to save a very considerable amount of money. That's the answer. Next, please. That, John. Yes, sir, step right up. Okay, my name is Brian York. I live at 21L Ridge. 
Um, I came in at 2.30, so I apologize up front if you've already gone over this. All right. Uh, but I saw in your presentation that you're considering baseboard heaters again for the block units and I believe for the brick units also. Um, it's um, uh, what I believe to be common knowledge out there that they're the single most inefficient means of heating a house and it's certainly been problems ever since they were installed and the central units were taken out. All right. Um, is that already written in stone? I think you mentioned that they're already paid for, which I cringed at when I heard. All right, uh, and so, I mean, I'm old enough and have lived at GHI long enough, basically, my, my age, 62 years now, uh, that I remember the central units uh, with, with fondness, to put it mildly. It doesn't seem like that's even an option. I'm not going to push that. I wish it was, all right, replacing the central units. But anyway, baseboard heaters, are they necessary? Is it still an option uh, that you're considering to go with different units? Uh, I think you mentioned some possibility of heat pumps. Um, what, what's the current state of thinking on that? Please come to the Buildings Committee meeting this coming week, which, uh, because that item is up for discussion, and the, um, uh, the existing baseboard heaters are at the end of their rated life, and we have been collecting money in the reserves replacement program to address that by replacing them, just as with any other of the original components. However, um, there are other options being considered, specifically the split system um, uh, mini heat pumps. And the board has not decided how to present that to the membership, but if, if I had to just, you know, take a wild guess, I would say that it's likely that the mini split heat pumps will be offered as a member option, and the base program will be replaced with the base four heaters. Okay, why not consider those as the option? Uh, or is the money, money. One of the things your board worries about and loses sleep about is making sure that, that every member can, play, can pay the monthly charges. And we have members who are on fixed income and who will not be able to afford the heat pump. And so we can't make that the de facto, well, we can't. We are unlikely to make that the required um, uh, upgrade because of that, of that issue. Okay, thanks, Steve. Hello, I'm Luisa Robles, 32F, as in Frank, Rich Road. Um, I have a question slash comment. Um, this Monday, council is going to be uh, hearing from the Prince George's Collaborative uh, that Bladensburg is heading, and that is a way by which um, individuals from medium and low income housing can get grants, or not grants, they just give you the money for weatherization. So those people that are concerned that their weatherization um, is not covered by the reserves, um, like the attics and crawl spaces, um, if the city does join this collaborative and if the individuals are low or medium income, they can have the money for their weatherization. I know a lot of people are concerned about not being able to pay for that, so that's an option. So just wondering if you all knew that council is considering that this Monday. If you're one of those individuals with low income or medium income, come to council and hear the proposal and then you can talk to council about supporting this. And the other thing, um, I wholeheartedly support the recycling of the materials from our renovations. So thanks to the board for considering that. I'm not gonna be able to be at the meeting this Wednesday, um, but I, I support that decision. Thank you, Louisa. Um, you give me an opportunity to uh, remind members that we have a task force that also is looking into what grants and low interest loans and other opportunities from our various government agencies from the local to the federal level might be available to members to help offset the cost of some of these improvements. And uh, we have identified a couple of programs and are following that. And we have actually a meeting this week set up with some, uh, some folks from um, at the federal level, in housing and urban development, to um, continue that discussion as well. So it certainly looks like there are opportunities 
um, reading through, uh, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do is read a number of the reports from the 1970s and early 80s rehab, and some of the information in there is fascinating. We're going to try and get some of that stuff on the website so people can read it. And uh, looking at uh, some of the financing opportunities that they were able to come up with uh, three years ago. Uh, next, please. Michael Hartman to our garden way. Oh, time up already? Wow. <laughs> oh, you know, go. Um, I want to speak to the financial and that what you just said and what Louisa said and what others have said about the financial situation. Um, if there are no other options available, um, I would strongly like to see GHI uh, form a good neighbor fund where the money would be uh, collected by donations, uh, by members or others, and that money can just be given to members who can't afford uh, these kinds of improvements. I know there have been loan programs and there have been payback uh, strategies and you know when the unit is sold to, for the money to be paid back. But I think it's important that sometimes when you're selling a unit, you don't have any excess proceeds from selling the unit. And I think that as a cooperative, as neighbors, we can develop a, a good neighbor fund and uh, be able to have a way to give people the money that they might need if they can show an uh, economic need for that without having to pay back anything. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Would you, uh, would you, would you, would you email that um, idea to me so that it doesn't get lost somehow? Yes, I, I did actually mention that at, at a previous board meeting, but um, I can do that as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'd like to read that. We've got, what, about 500? questions on cars at this point. So, you know, I'd like to just take a minute and read a couple of those and then before we get to the next person. Oh, here's, some, here's some more. Okay, so this, this, I'm sorry. Those are all frequently asked. A lot of people frequently asked, okay. Um, well, here's, yeah, here's a definitely a frequently asked one. How much attic storage space will the blown-in insulation reduce? Now, the answer is when we designed the pilot program, uh, the um, the board decided that there was going to be a section in the center, and we're talking only about the frames and bricks, of course, since my home, block home, has no attic. Um, there was going to be a center section of 192 square feet. I'm not going to explain where we got that number. But um, later on, we decided that that wasn't really uh, the best way to do it, and we decided that when there's going to be blown insulation, we will make a space with plywood floor the full width of the attic under the, under the ridge um, to a width of where the wall would be three feet tall. Two, two feet tall, thank you for the correction. And, and, and whatever that space is would not have blown in insulation, but instead it would have hardboard foam insulation with plywood flooring, and that would be your great storage space. And then, and, and then outside of that area, there would be a plywood dam and then and building insulation on the outside. So, uh, sir, would you like to speak your question? Sure, sure. My name is John Ott, and I'm also from 42 Court. And I would rather uh, attempt to ask the questions rather than have them all answered since time is... Sorry about that. How can you hear me? Rather than have them answered, uh, maybe you can just consider them. If we get new windows, a lot of people have window air conditioners. Are we still going to be able to use the windows with window units? Or, uh, if the, when I was here in 82, contractors came through. I wasn't at home. I was at work. And they rampaged through the attics, came through, busted through the doors, and all your valuables and everything are out there. And you come home several hours later only to find out that they've been there. Uh, number three, pet issues. What do we do with our dogs? I have a little doggy door. I know that's probably not kosher, but I enjoy that. And so if they put in new doors, will there be any, any way of attempting to keep one in any way, shape, or form? Uh, the other one, uh, the attics. A lot of people accumulate things over the years. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> OK, what I'm saying is, so you get this stuff, and it accumulates over a period of time. And now something happens to you physically. I had an incident, a health incident, some few years ago, my equilibrium's off, I can't do things like I used to do. So will there be people that can help you move things and store things if necessary? And who will that be charged to? Uh, let's see. 
Of course, there's others, but I think my time is just about up. You would consider this, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, and, and uh, as you came up and spoke with me during the break, you have written those questions down, and we will do our very best to, to address them. One of the things I would like to remind everyone is that the pilot program was a great learning, is a great learning experience for us in the technical arena, talking to the building scientists, trying to figure out what's the best insulation and what's the best you know, heating system and whatnot. But it's also an opportunity to learn other stuff, such as what do we do with people who need a pet door? What do we do with people who can't empty their attic? And, and how, do we, um, how do we deal with that? And scheduling, how do we schedule work so that there's as little disturbance for members as possible? And all of those are things that we have had learning about in the pilot program, and I'm sure we'll continue to have learning about. So let me uh, let, go ahead, Councilman Roberts. How you doing? I'm, I'm not Councilman Roberts today. I'm Rodney Roberts from 38M Ridge Road. <laughs> I have a stake in this too. Uh, I have the, probably the same question I had before, and I'm, I'm wondering why we're limiting ourselves on the heating side of this uh, to two options that are really not good options. And for example, you know, my mom lives right down in Lakewood here in a house that's twice the size of mine. About, 2000, about 1,900 square feet. Uh, it was built in 1958. It still has the original uh, 1958 insulation. It has, doesn't have any upgraded insulation, even in the attic, I'm sorry to say. It's something I should have done a long time ago. But regardless of that, uh, her bill, I talked to her last week. She said her bill to heat her house uh, last month uh, was $85 to, to operate her, she has a 95%, a 75,000 BTU, 95% efficient uh, gas furnace. And it cost, cost her $85 a month and $35 for her electric bill. Uh, I've noticed that Everyone around us has gas service. Even our larger homes on uh, Ridge Road, I understand, have gas service. So all the churches in Greenbelt has gas service. This building has gas service. Roosevelt Center has gas service. Even uh, one of the uh, people on uh, Hillside Road, or a former uh, a board member of GHI, has gas service in his frame unit that he had brought in from Northway Road when he built his addition. So we have gas service all around us. Why are we not doing that for everyone? Because that, if we did that, we wouldn't need new windows, new doors, two inches of siding or two inches of foam insulation on the outside of our buildings or any of that. You put in a 45,000 BTU gas furnace and we would all be very warm for very cheap. So why are we ignoring that? Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is a, this is a complicated question. The, the incomplete and short answer is that GHI did look at and, and negotiate with Washington Gaslight years ago uh, before the first rehab and then since about getting gas mains into GHI. And were not able to reach an agreement. Not not saying that Washington Gas wasn't willing to do it, but we're not able to reach an agreement, and it had to do with the co-op having to guarantee a certain consumption level or a certain number of minimum number of members who would switch to gas appliances and whatnot. Um, there is a more complicated answer to that. Let me see you. Yes. Yes. Please do. In nineteen Nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, GHI looked extensively at RTC. We had discussions with Washington Gas and they said that if we had six hundred units that were interested in consuming gas, that they would do this. And GHI hired a mechanical engineering consulting company and they designed several options for gas heating within the homes. We had bit specs developed and there was actually we had intended to institute a pilot program in a particular home. And the costs were so high. I think the cost was about $24,000 for this system. 
and without any, any payback. And that's really the reason why we didn't proceed with, with that as a viable, as a viable alternative. It was supposed to be $24,000 that would have been for installing the heating pipes within the home, as well as the system. In that particular unit, it was supposed to be a gas furnace, which would actually heat the water, and the water would then be distributed to radiators, hot water radiators within the building. But we also looked at several other systems. One other system was a high velocity type of um, base, a high velocity system with, with air, with hot air. And that was even more expensive than the first system which I just, which I just mentioned. So the board of directors spent a tremendous amount of time over a number of years looking at this around 1970s, I think it would be 97, 98, and it was not viable at that time. And I think as well that Pearl, when we engaged them, they also looked at this in their analyses. They did analyses of a variety of systems, and that was something that they also ruled out because they didn't think that there would be you know, a viable payback. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, let me just read another question from a card. Why not? Is it possible to install on frame homes the one inch exterior insulation on individual units, or does this decision need to be done per building? And can this be done on, can it be done on individual units? Uh, the, the answer is the board has yet to decide. However, the, it, it seems as though it is likely that members would be able to, at the very least, in pairs of units. So if it's a row of four, maybe the two, one end and one middle would be able to insulate together, and then the other end maybe not. But, uh, and, and the reason that there's this question is strictly an aesthetic reason, because the insulation, of course, has thickness, and there would be a, a vertical line at the exterior where the party wall is. So. It's, a, it's an aesthetic question. <clears throat> and if you live in a one bedroom unit, no, you would not be able to insulate just the upstairs. And not the downstairs. So your upstairs and downstairs neighbor would definitely have to. Who's, who's next? Uh, Mr. Hughes. Hi, Theodora Scrato on Hillside Road. I think it's wonderful that you've had this town hall meeting and are really reaching out to the community, and I am so thankful that you looked into spray foam and are not considering that for the insulation. But as I mentioned, I know I don't speak just for myself. I'm concerned about the, air, the attic seal perimeter, which also right now has spray foam as what will be used. And um, I just think it would be really important to think about more environmental and non-toxic approaches for that. I know we talked about that, but knowing that information before we go to the vote to know what we're voting on would be really helpful. And um, thank you. Yeah, the, um, the issue here is that there's a, there's a balance that has to be struck between the, you know, the applicability and suitability of, of each material that's being considered versus the cost and potential toxicity and availability and longevity. So it's a, there are a number of factors that need to be considered, but certainly uh, hazard to health is, is the higher level. I, I didn't use my two minutes, so I'll just say yes. I think our health is the most important thing, and especially because if you even go into it at all, it then becomes toxic when you cut into it, as you wrote in your report. So I hope you'll prioritize our health first. Thank you. Thank you. Here's, a, here's another question, I don't remember which is one that comes up a lot. Why are we not considering interior insulation to preserve the historic character of the block homes? Well, we, actually we have. Uh, we, we, we had a study done by uh, Evans Architects and, you know, on that specific issue because there are members in our community who believe that the um, exterior appearance of the block homes is an iconic feature of the historic Greenbelt, and they don't want to see that change. And the, uh, the result of the study, unfortunately, was that 
the uh, trying to insulate the homes from the interior has a number of drawbacks. The first of which is it's tremendously disturbing to the basically the having that your home when, when this work is being done. And the and the second thing is it is very expensive. And the third thing is, and probably this is the most important, it doesn't give very much insulation to do it on the inside. And the fourth thing is that it actually makes an already small room even smaller. And so based on those four things, um, the, the architects themselves, you know, the historic preservation architects, decided that it was a great idea. And we agreed with them. Who's next? Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Laura Schaffer. I live at 59D Ridge. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that I enjoy living in Greenbelt. I like the tranquility. I like the community. Um, and I'm approaching my two-year mark. I moved in on Labor Day weekend of 2013. Um, and now I'm trying to make a decision, do I stay or do I go? Um, how you stay? <laughs> I, I, you know, in looking at the time frame for fixing our homes, I live in a frame home. Um, you all probably know me because of significant notes I've sent regarding my crawl space. Um, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned that you're going to be testing this pilot program in the crawl spaces. Um, how are you going to choose the houses? When are they going to be chosen? When is this going to start? Um, and my concern too is, are you going to pick homes that have minimal problems in their crawl space? Or are you going to choose homes that really have problems and that you're really going to test? In other words, are we going to pick your crawl space? <laughs> that would be one. But I understand like, I'm not the only person in this community that has problems. Um, and, and if my home isn't chosen, how long am I going to have to wait? You know, I'm looking at, at how long, you know, the, the funding that I'm paying every month for, you know, I know it goes partially to land taxes and partially to maintenance and all the other, other stuff, but it comes out to something like, for the five-year um, time frame, it's something like $18,900 that I'm paying. And if I'm waiting that long, I can put that in the bank and save up and put it down somewhere else on a house that I can control what's going on in it and fix it when it needs to get fixed. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. To answer the first question, it has not been determined which crawl spaces. We're, we're still in the process of looking at the crawl spaces. Eldon, would you like to say something else on this subject? Yes. One of the things that we are going to do is definitely not pick a crawl space that has got some sort of a drainage problem around the home. So in that particular case of 59D Ridge, we looked at that, at that unit, we looked at the yard, and we are planning in the spring to undertake a drainage improvement project. It's an underground drainage system that has to be installed on the, on the outside, which means that we aren't able to undertake that pilot project within that row of units. So we're absolutely making sure that the crawl spaces which are selected are absolutely dry. And obviously, if there are other problems in there, such as insulation within the frame homes, that's most of it is not intact, that would be a factor that's taken into consideration. We wish that we could, you know, we could be doing more than two because we know that there is an urgent need for this. But unfortunately, it's only going to be, you know, it's only going to be four buildings which are which are which are selected. What I can tell you though is that when we decide to embark on the larger project, then our recommendation is going to be for the cross space remediation to do the worst ones. First. Okay? Let me read another question from the card. Okay, so when will the visuals on the screen be available? And when will the explanation that was read be with them? So we are videotaping, as you know, this uh, this session, smile with the camera. And the intent is to have this video available within a few weeks' time. There's, a, there's an editing process, as you can imagine. And so within about maybe three weeks to a month or so, we hope to have this available on our YouTube channel and have it also on the uh, um, on Fios and, uh, and Comcast. And the 
scripts for the town hall meeting, it hadn't occurred to me that we might want to put these up on the website. It might not be a bad idea. So maybe maybe we would want to put these scripts up on the website, which, which is something that I think is and, 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 and this PowerPoint as well. You're like, PowerPoint's a pretty big file. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's too. It's a pretty big file. So we, we might we might have to edit it out a little bit and then maybe put some of it. Great. Great. Philip Hyatt, Levity Ridge Road. Uh, first, I'd like to let uh, the membership know that I've been a very active attender for over two years at the building committee meetings and have made uh, a lot of appearances at board meetings too. First thing, I'd like to make a comment of what I didn't see and what I haven't seen in, in, in today and at those uh, meetings. No real discussion of uh, through the wall air conditioners and window air conditioners, how they affect members' comfort. Uh, no analysis of cost of that. Also, no significant discussion around storm doors as a factor. Getting some doors replaced, it's probably a good idea. Storm doors are also a significant part of heat uh, infiltration. This is the part that really uh, is important for all of you to hear. Uh, Steve used the phrase, uh, end of their uh, rated life, referring to the windows, doors, and uh, baseboard heaters. Uh, not all elements degrade at the same rate. A window that's never opened, uh, a baseboard heater that's never turned on, a door that is seldom used is not going to degrade at the same rate as one is used every day. To think that all of our units, all our windows, all our doors, all our baseboard heaters are going to fail in 2016 and have to be replaced, I'd ask everybody to really think that through before we spend our money that we very smartly save. But do we need to be spending it right now on these things, on things like crawl spaces, which was really not part of the pilot program, but has come up to be a very important interest item, is now present. Thank you. Great time. So I'm going to try and answer those three questions quickly, but I'm going to take the last one first. The, um, to, to correct the last statement that Mr. Payette made, the crawl spaces have always been a part of the pilot program. Um, storm doors we have looked at, and the building science is very clear, and I don't agree with it either. I have storm doors on my house, and I think that they're great. The building science is that storm door never pays for itself in energy savings. I don't know. I still like my storm doors. There, you know, we're talking right now about having an option for members to uh, purchase a new storm door with a new regular door, and that's something that the board is going to deal with. So, and then, um, I forgot what the first thing was, darn it. Oh why, oh, why are they all wearing out now? Well, of course they're not all. Of course all the baseboard heaters aren't wearing out all at the same time, and neither are all the doors. However, in order to mount a program of 1,600 homes or 992 frame homes, it, it, the, the scheduling dimension gets completely out of control if you don't have a, a, a logical program of moving through the community and doing the replacements proactively. Now we, we did speak in the pilot program at great length about uh, through the wall and window air conditioners um, because in uh, certain of the homes, in order to put the exterior siding on, and I'm talking about the blocks now, many of the many of the members have through wall air conditioners, and to do the siding, we had to take those out. And there was, a, there was a big discussion about, about that, about whether they would be put back or whether, you know, the member might choose a heat pump, in which case he wouldn't want because we would have a hole in the side of the house. And so there was, there was great, great discussion about that. Window air conditioners will be uh, allowed to be put back in a frame home, which are double hung windows. With, um, the, the double hung windows will accept a regular uh, window air conditioner. Um, it's great if members take their window air conditioners out of the window every winter. The window air conditioner left in the home in, in the wintertime 
is just like leaving the window open. So it's great if you take them out. Well, through the wall, you, you can't take them out. Through the, yeah, if you have a through the wall air conditioner, the, the best you can do is buy one of those quilted covers and, and put it on. And, and you know, if you can get up on a ladder and cover it with plastic from the outside, but most importantly, cover it with some sort of a quilted cover on the inside, at least to keep the air infiltration down. Here's a uh, here's a question on a card, which we haven't thought about at all, really. Where will money come from to hire and pay the extra staff we're going to need? I actually would like Mr. Ralph to talk about that because he's been, he's been thinking a lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that is done in GHI, the membership pays for. That's a simple. That's a simple answer. But let me just elaborate a bit. Uh, we've been collecting monies for the replacement reserve program, so it's going to mean that a portion of that cost is going to be charged to the replacement reserve budget. With regard to the non-reserve items, as some of the speakers said, we've got to get a loan. We haven't yet decided what are going to be the sources for that, you know, for the sources of funding, but out of that loan, we would have to include costs of additional, costs of additional staff. And one of the things that we're looking at as well is the capitalization of those costs. And let me explain what that, what that means. Uh, right now, with the GHI staff that we have, the salaries are paid through the operations budget, which means that all of those costs are expensed in that particular year. For a project like this, it's a capital project, and therefore we will take all of those costs. And of course, the finance department, they have got to advise us whether this is the right course. But what we are contemplating is to take all of those costs, which would include the contractor's costs, as well as the extra staff that we are going to be hiring that's going to be associated with this project. And instead of expensing all of that in one year, it's going to be expensed over a long period of time. It's going to be capitalized, and it's going to be depreciated. Let's say, Joe, over what period of time? Generally, for, for, for I, I would say, you know, 20 years. Yes, over, over, for example, a 20 year period, which means that it would have, not have as great an effect on estimated fee increases as if you were going to expense all of it, you know, in one year. Yes. A much better explanation than I could give. Okay, here's another question from Carr. Um, I moved in my house six months ago. Windows in very poor condition. I replaced them at my cost. Will they be taken out and replaced in the upgrade? And if not, will I get a credit? Well, the, the answer is if you've replaced your windows and they meet the specification, meet or exceed the specification of the windows that GHI is planning to provide, then, and they're in good condition, of course, then the answer is no, they would not be taken out. They're, that would be silly to, to take out almost new windows and replace them, and, and it just costs money that it's just throwing away money. So no, we would not um, replace those windows. And no, there would not be a credit because the reserves replacement program is not based on single components. It's based on the entire um, need of the entire corporation. Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, so my name is Carrie. I'm a new member on Westway, and my question is also about the heating. I cannot attend Wednesday's meeting because I'm working. Um, so I just wanted to, first of all, ask um, Mr. Eldon if you could provide any data or assessment from what you had talked about in terms of the um, the gas having gas heat. You had said that you guys did some kind of assessment with Washington Gas a while ago. I was wondering if we could have access to that information um, in terms of the cost. Um, secondly, in terms of the heat pumps versus um, the baseboard heating, I live in a block and 
Um, just over the last month, my heating bill with only three baseboard heaters on, not, I didn't use all the heaters in the house, was several hundred dollars. And um, I guess my concern is, you had said that the heat pump was not, con you know, for some people it would be a member option versus for all of the houses, so because of the cost for low-income members, but I'm wondering if you've done any assessments of what the per unit cost per family for each month, like if someone's paying several hundred dollars a month and not using their baseboards at full capacity and therefore less comfortable, um, if there is that, if that's being compared to the upfront costs of putting in the heat pump systems. Thank you. Great, great question. Thank you. The, uh, the, the answer to your question is yes. The uh, a significant part of the pilot program was modeling by the building scientists of what would be the projected energy usage in the homes for this kind of a solution, that kind of a solution. If you put the insulation, what happens? If you put a heat pump in, what happens, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of information, and that is available on the website. And if you have access to the internet and you go to the ghi.coop website and look under the Homes Improvement Program, pilot program at the page, at the bottom of that page, there are all of the reports from the building scientists, and there's a tremendous amount of data in there. We also have anecdotal data that's come in from our pilot members, and we and we also uh, who have heat pumps have had heat pumps installed, and the answer is that they are doing really well anecdotally. That that members are, are pretty happy with them in terms of the heating cost and the lower electricity bills are quite a bit more efficient than baseboard heaters, uh, and. The other thing that I want to say is we have quite a number of members throughout the community who over the past few years at their own expense have installed these split system heat pumps. So we're hoping to do a quick sort of survey and gather some more anecdotal data. I, I don't know what that number is. I'm guessing you know, we can find out because we have permits for them, but I'm guessing there may be 75 to 100 of those heat pumps in the community. So we should be able to get pretty good information about, about how they act and, and, and and, and whether or not it's going to be worthwhile. The cost per unit in the pilot program, Tom, about 7000 8000 a little bit under $8,000 per unit. That was just average, yeah, but, but some of the units were bigger than others because there were a couple of additions, right? right. So, so that gives you an idea of what you're, and that was an installed cost. Um, hopefully that, you know, if a significant number of members choose that option and we're buying a couple hundred heat pumps, hopefully we would be able to significantly improve on that. Yeah, she's in the block, that's right. Well, <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, those of us who live in block homes are actually kind of in the worst case, worst starting case because there's no insulation in our walls. Your wall has about an R3, believe it or not, insulation, pretty bad. And uh, the, the other thing I want to say is that the building science is pretty clear, the best uh, return on your investment is first to s do insulation and, c and air sealing to the extent you're able before you spend money on a new heating system. Okay, however, it, 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 it is possible to do none of that and just replace the heating system and still, you know, get a very positive result. So the block, the block homes, actually there's uh, real marked improvements available to us and either by doing the insulation and siding or by putting the heat pump in and, and if you want to do both that's great because it costs a lot more money and the, the 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 unit return for each one of those things gets a little bit, a little bit worse okay maybe for another card yeah so will there be prorating of the cost for people who have already at their cost had windows or doors replaced? Well, we kind of actually already deal with that. The answer, the answer to that is no. The reverse replacement program is based on community-wide need, not on individuals. My name is Leonie Hinshaw and I live at 33A Ridge. I am in a block home and my bill is expensive. Um, my question has to do, you said there is a reserve money for baseboard heaters. If it was decided by the community that we were going to do the heat pumps, could we not take that reserve money 
and put it into the heat pumps, and then how much more would, on top of that, would it cost to get the heat pumps? I live in a block unit. I got a, I got a heat pump two years ago. I love it. It's really great. I still need baseboard heaters. I have to turn one on when it gets down to the 30s. I have to turn on two when it gets down to the 20s. My heat bill is lower than it used to be. I must say $500 a year, which comes nowhere near paying the $10,000. It costs me uh, before the thing becomes replaced in 15 or 18 years. In other words, it's so much nicer, but it is still more expensive than baseboard heaters alone. I've been involved a lot with the uh, systems all along. I was in a pilot program before I got to be on the board, and what I found was that baseboard heaters use more electricity than most anything else, but the total cost with the installation is lower. It's cheaper with just baseboard heaters. You still need baseboard heaters if you have a heat pump. Okay. Yes, I, I disagree with them also. <laughs> The documentation says they stop working, even the best of them, when it gets down to 14 degrees. Yeah, just a little technical point here. A heat pump uh, takes uh, takes heat out of the outside air and, and puts it into the house. So obviously, as the temperature of the outside air is lower, it's more difficult and the heat pump has to work harder in order to still take enough heat out to keep the house comfortable. And it used to be that it was in the 30s that heat pumps basically cut off and, and were no good. The, these new heat pumps are much more efficient than the old ones, and they do work down to like 14 or 15 degrees, but they don't work as well. And that's what Mr. Jones is saying. I, I, I do have to just say, Bill, you like to keep your house quite warm, so. <laughs> Also, um, some, um, some of the modern heat pumps can be furnished with uh, backup electric heating systems in the, air, in the interior air handlers. Most of them are not anymore, but that is, that is also an option. Okay, here's another, uh, here's another card. For items deemed optional, such as bath fans or other items, will there be a group rate purchase option? Now, the answer to that is yes, we hope so. The, the idea is, if members opt in, then the heat pumps are a perfect example. If you know, if, if we get 200 members who, who opt in for the heat pumps, then that would be a group purchase that would be handled by GHI, who would contract for the installation of, of those heat pumps. However, the next item says, does member option mean at members' expense? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. But over the course of time, I was potentially in the co-op team, not all yes. the time. Yes, yes. It would, well, a member could obviously opt to pay for the heat pump or any other member option item up front, or a member could choose to finance it. And our finance committee, and I certainly encourage everyone to come to finance committee meeting. Mr. Hess has told me that the next one is on February the 5th. Uh, the finance committee is actively talking about financing options for members on the Homes Improvement Program and, and how that's going to work. They're deferring about, they're talking about a member deferral, loan deferral program, for example, for members who um, are having a hard time with their monthly fees but still want some of these member opt-in items. It will be possible, it may be possible, presuming that we can adopt this, for a member to defer the loan payments until the unit is sold, at which time the co-op would then get the, get the full payment and interest back. So in that, in that case, the member's fee would not go up, but the amount of equity that is in the home would be reduced a little bit at, set, at settlement when the loan is sold. It's called a deferment program. Right, 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 right. If it's a yeah, member option items would only be paid for by members who are receiving them. In other words, those 200 members who opt for heat pumps, each of those 200 members has to pay for his or her heat pump. If I don't opt for a heat pump, I don't pay anything for those 200 heat pumps because they're not mine. Okay. 
So number opt-in items are strictly paid for by the members. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jesse Meltzer. I live at Lungy Northway, which is a brick unit. When they put in uh, our new slate roofs, they use nails that were about an inch and a half too long, so it's dangerous to go up there. So instead of doing, let's say, the sprayed-in insulation, is it possible to do sheet and just stick it onto the nails that are already there? The <laughs> unfortunate yeah, answer to that is no. And, and that is a, and there are two ways to insulate an attic. And, and the way you're describing is very problematic because it has to be done so carefully, otherwise you end up rotting the wood of the roof because you trap water we've learned, between the slate and the insulation and then, and then the roof rots. So we but rejected still, that option. There's still a gap between the eaves. Well, uh, well it, it's not about the eaves. It's about if, if, if you actually... Well, I mean, if the, actually, there's the two by fours that are yeah. going this way. Yeah. So there's still a gap of about four inches between... Oh, you're the saying top. put the insulation on the, on the bottom of the roof trusses, the roof joists? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is because then it's a it, safety thing as well. So it has to be done so carefully in order to do that humidity control that the building scientists strongly recommend against our doing that. Okay. One more from the cards. For the options chosen by the member that will be incorporated into the co op fees, is there an estimated uh, interest rate known at this time? Would our treasurer like to answer that question? The short answer is no. However, we have been looking at a rate for discussion of 6%. However, I don't think the final rate would be set until we actually would be making the loan and we see what the market is. Our intent is to have it basically mirror the market. Go ahead, Holly. <laughs> Hello, this is Holly Wheeler, um, 8D Ridge Road. Um, I just want to quickly thank you all and all the committees for all of the huge amount of work and effort and grief that you've done. I think you're doing a fantastic job. Um, I do have a question um, about the mundane aspects of actually bathroom ventilation fans. Um, and I apologize if you've already covered this, but when we uh, renovated our um, first JHI house, which was on, um, in 13 Court, we renovated the bathroom and we installed the ceiling fan. And so we learned, uh, Joe and I, all sorts of things about the technicalities of bathroom ventilation fans. And um, one thing we learned is that um, there's a huge difference in the quality of ventilation fans. Uh, it has to do with the efficiency of the fan. Um, a lot of it has to do with the noise of the fan. And not surprisingly, the more affordable ones are very loud. Um, quiet fans are more expensive. Have, has there been discussion, and how would that work when it's an option, um, but is it there, GHI would buy one type of ventilation fan and then you would have to either opt in and opt out of that or would there be opportunities for members to decide which fan to, to install based on the quality of the fan and the, the noisiness of the fan. And I just asked that because I saw in the estimate it was a set price to, you know, opt in to, to get a ventilation fan and that didn't seem to account for the varying qualities of fans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes, it would be a fan that would be specified for use in GHI. And, it, uh, and in the pilot program, we did specify a very quiet fan, right? What they call low sone fan. And one of the reasons is that, particularly in the block homes, but also in the other homes, we're gonna, we want to use that fan for humidity control. And so we want it to run longer. We want to put we want a, 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 an electronic timer and maybe even a time of day controller on that fan so that it runs more. It's not going to just run when you turn the bathroom light on. And so we want it to be quiet so that it, you know, it's not going to upset members and you know, keep the baby from napping and all of that stuff. But it would be one fan. Is that the microphone? Go ahead. 
Okay, here's a, uh, here's a different kind of question, but one which is very important. What are the plans for the larger townhomes? Attic insulation, windows, revamp the heating system? Those are purposes, of course. I'd like uh, Mr. Ralph to come up and talk about that. We have 25 larger townhomes, and there are four large single-family homes. These homes were constructed in 1970, 1971, so they're much newer than the frame and the masonry homes. Let's deal first of all with the four single-family homes. GHI has replaced roofs, their flat roofs, and we've replaced those roofs over the past three or four years and we have substantially improved the level of insulation on those roofs. We installed insulation board under the membrane, and the value of that insulation was R23. Now, within, the, within these homes, they have got gas furnaces. So they're not in the same situation as the frame and masonry homes. Those are more efficient systems, and we have, over the past few years, we placed all of those. Tom, did we, did we complete that program of replacing all the furnaces? Yeah. Yes, we, we have replaced all of those furnaces within those homes, and those were paid for through the replacement reserves project. And I think we are going to be embarking on the replacement of the air condensing systems. Yes, I think we started that about a year ago, and that's going to continue. Let's look at the crawl space situation. These homes have got basements. So, and these basements, some members have converted them into living spaces. GHI sometime around, I think it might have been in early, 90s, they had hired a company to install a comprehensive drainage system. It's an interceptive system to prevent water from getting into those basements. And we do have monies within the replacement reserve project to do a repair of that system when the time when the time comes. I can't remember precisely what's the estimated date that that project has got to be addressed. Uh, within the 25 larger townhomes, they've got attics, and the value of the insulation in those attics is approximately an R19, and the walls have got an R13, which is much better than the masonry homes. As we told you, the masonry homes only have an R3, an R and it's about a little better than the, than the frame homes. Uh, we haven't really given active consideration towards whether members within the larger homes who want to increase the insulation within their attics, whether they should be included in this program. And I think it's something that we need to, we need to consider. If they are interested in having their attics upgraded with additional insulation, then I don't think that there is a great degree of difficulty to accommodate that. You men are going to have the last question of the day. Okay. Trudy Renwick, uh, 22 Hillside, Unit E, Frame Home. My question is, how are you going to decide the order of, of making these, these improvements? Because like many other people here, I'm probably thinking, should I stay or should I go? And, if my house is in 2016, it's a different decision than if I have to wait till 2021. You're so right. And, and the, the, you know, the, the sort of rude answer is, I'm not going to decide. We're going to, we're going to hire a, a project manager who's going to have you know, staff, and they're going to figure out a construction schedule, which is going to meet the needs of members and contractors and GHI and our reserves payments and all of that. And, and that's how those decisions will be taken. But that's, it's, it's premature to, uh, to make, to try and make those decisions right now. Okay, the witching hour is upon us, it's four o'clock. So I want to thank everyone for coming. This has been so much fun for me. And, uh,